Yeah, so ChatGPT is a language model by OpenAI, which interacts in a conversational way. The dialogue format makes it possible for ChatGPT to answer follow-up questions or refine its answers. Uh, and also the interesting thing about ChatGPT is that unlike previous iterations of GPT, it's been trained to reject inappropriate requests and generally be friendlier for the end user to interact with. It feels like an alien intelligence that happened to learn English. I and mean, it's really good yeah. at it, but like, and for the most <laughs> part, it'll fool you, but the underlying mechanic is really alien. Hey, this is Shri. I'm a YC alum and a research engineer focused on natural language processing for search. Hi, and I'm Will. I'm a YC alum and independent researcher who's worked across e-commerce, cryptocurrency, and financial industries. Welcome to The Technique, where we talk about the edge of technology and what we can build with it. An optimistic look at the road ahead. We're two guys discussing edgy, fringe, and overlooked technologies over a couple of drinks. Our show has four segments. First, we give a high-level outline of what the technology is. Second, we talk about what it can do today. Then, we let our optimism take over and see how the world could change if it was readily adopted everywhere. Lastly, if we believe in this future, how can we take a position on it? We can't be experts in everything we cover, so if you've got insights on this week's topic, let us know in the comments, and be sure to check out our audio versions on Apple Podcasts and Spotify so you can go about your day as, list, uh, as you listen. But first, uh, in the spirit of chatting over some drinks, uh, what are we drinking today? Uh, so for me, we've run out of hipster things to drink <laughs> in Whole Foods, and so... Uh, this time I picked up Temptation, which is a barrel-aged ale, aged in Chardonnay barrels right over here. So uh, I guess I got sucked in with the label. Oh, nice. It's been a while since uh, we have had al actual alcohol on this show. We started out with it, and then we moved to these weird hipster things. Uh, I have managed to find one remaining holdout, which I haven't tried yet. Uh, which is skin tea, collagen sparkling tea. It sounds terrible. Yeah, it's uh, so close to being like badly branded. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I thought it would be gloopy because that's what I imagine that collagen is like, but it's not. Uh, but it says, I guess the implication is that it's going to give me radiant skin. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean, moisturizer and good sleep will do it. But if you can't get that, I guess you can get some skin tea. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah. Uh, I am excited to chat with you about this week's topic. Um, so this week yeah. we what, are... are... What, what are we covering today? I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, People can't get enough of this, and so I thought we should cover it as well. Uh, this week, we are talking about ChatGPT. So ChatGPT is a language model by OpenAI, which interacts in a conversational way. Uh, the dialogue format makes it possible for ChatGPT to answer follow-up questions or refine its answers. Uh, and also, the interesting thing about ChatGPT is that unlike previous iterations of GPT, it's been trained to reject inappropriate requests and generally be friendlier for the end user to interact with. So it's a, a mix of something old, which is GPT-3, which has been around for a little while, but the interface, as well as some details about how it was trained, uh, make it much more amenable to be used by lay people and not just uh, tech nerds. Oh, I see. So it sounds like the underlying language model, the deep learning language model is still the same, but they slapped a better user interface on it to unlock its potential so that people can better understand what it is that we have in our hands with these large language models. Is that correct? Yeah, basically. It's interesting because it really snuck up on people who were even adjacent to tech. So I think that people uh, like me and other people who are interested in machine learning and AI and, and work with it were familiar with the capabilities of 
GPT-3. But there were a lot of people who I know who are designers, product managers, and other roles in tech who had heard the buzz about GPT-3, but never really got it. And what was interesting to me was that as soon as the capabilities were available in a chatbot format, it somehow opened up this huge wave of possibility where people immediately got what it was, even though it's not substantially a big step change in capability over what was there six months ago. Yeah, I I think it's just that with GPT-3, when it came out, you had to do a lot of work in setting up the prompt. And so if you don't do it quite right, you don't really get the response that you would think of an intelligent agent to give you. Sometimes it's just not what you want. And so I, I think they've narrowed the possibilities to something where it's mostly acceptable to people and and that uh, I think really opened up people's imagination. Funny how that is, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess it goes a long way. Uh, uh, user experience goes a long way. Uh, so with that, actually, I want to get into ChatGPT, but also the origins and the lineage of ChatGPT. Uh, by the way, for this episode, I think that we're going to assume that if you're listening to a podcast like this, You've seen what ChatGPT is, and you uh, you can try it out. It's readily available. It's very, very accessible. So we're not going to go too much into the surface level details of how ChatGPT works and the simple things that you could do with it. All of that stuff is readily available. So going beyond the surface level, what I want to get into and discuss is the lineage and the origins of what ChatGPT is. Because like we've been sort of alluding to, there are layers to this onion. It's not that ChatGPT just came out of nowhere. It's a amalgamation of things that have been around for a while. But what I found really, really interesting was that just as much as it snuck up on the lay people in that there were these latent capabilities, which then once you put a chatbot interface, it suddenly became accessible. Even to me, I've been following OpenAI and what they've been doing and the models that they've been training for a while, but because of their branding, which is maybe an interesting decision on their part, they've kept the same name, GPT-3, but then progressively enhanced it with more and more capabilities to the point where it kind of felt like boiling the frog. Like I didn't feel any different between subsequent GPT revisions until all of a sudden I realized that this thing could do what it couldn't do two or three years ago. Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised that it's even just two years ago. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So GPT-3 is a language model, which means that it's been trained on the task of generating continuations of text. It's basically trained on autocomplete. And when it was first released, it was that that was all it was trained on was it it took a huge copy of the internet and then uh, the task was to generate text that was continuation of some text before it and that came out around 2 years ago and what was interesting about that model was that it had basically learned a lot about the world uh and it was also very good at generating coherent text uh, that uh, given some prefix. And so that was great in that you could use it to, I don't know, generate a little story or a short story or a short Mm -hmm. paragraph or something like that. But it was also limited in that, at least when it initially came out, that's all people were using it for was to do things like AI Dungeon, which was a kind of game where it would generate yeah. little snippets of uh, a, I don't know what you would call it, like a text-based role-playing game. Yeah, it would like be that. like uh, Dungeons & Dragons, where the computer could actually play a Dungeon Master. Uh, people tried out that sort of stuff. Yeah, exactly. And so it was, gr- it was good for language generation, basically. That was the initial release of GPT-3. 
and it was trained with that explicit task in mind. Now, what was interesting is that they took that initial GPT-3 model and then trained it on code. And that was when things started to get interesting. And by the way, this is this 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 lineage that we're talking about uh, it was sort of sussed out by this uh, AI researcher. We'll put uh, the link in the show notes to uh, his write up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, basically, once they took GPT three and trained it on code, that ended up unlocking a bunch of new capabilities. The most interesting uh, part about that is that it unlocked the capability of complex reasoning. So previously, these models could just generate text. But now, because they've seen code, and code is maybe a serialized way of representing logic, I guess I'm just you know hand-waving here, but code is kind of a way in which humans encode uh, some sequence of, of reasoning. I suppose that unlocked the capability of GPT-3 now to reason step by step about some problem. So, for example, what yeah. it could uh, do now with that code tuning, which it couldn't do before, was that you could ask it a kind of problem, and then it would be able to reason out a sequence of sub problems uh, and solve those, and finally give you the answer, which combines all of those subsequent steps. So I think so, an example of what you're talking about is, say, like, uh, typically these l- large language models have been bad at doing things that you would think of computers as typically being good at, such as, like, adding numbers or sorting or something like that. But as it turns out, for some of these language models, presumably the ones that can do reasoning, you can actually lead it step by step to sort numbers. So you just have to break it down a little bit and ask it to do that task, and then it'll sort the sequence of numbers, right? That That's the sort of thing you're talking about. Yeah, something like that. Or even if you were to combine the reasoning task with like a word problem for example oh right a word problem where where like i don't know like alice has five candy and bob has seven and their mom operated on them and so how is this possible that sort of thing like basically yeah. logic puzzles right yes yes uh, like logic yeah puzzles, i just yes. said a nonsensical like amount <laughs> you like, combined two right, types combined of... two but <laughs> Yes. But so so this is the type of reasoning thing that we're talking about. And so I don't know when you said that, that, that surprises me because like how is I can see how if you're trained, if the LLM is trained on code, it should be able to reason about code because effectively my mental model for it is that it's a really sophisticated autocomplete. Like it can look back, I don't know, 1,024 tokens and then be able to calculate the next most probable token to display and then that gives a sense of um consistency across a longer memory so that um it it seems like it knows what it's talking about but if so that would make sense that it can then reason about code but then i'm really surprised that it would be able to generalize this reasoning about code based on the probabilities of the next token to any other reasoning task like how is it able to make that leap like do you yeah. that that seems to be a little bit magical like do, do you <laughs> yes right like what, what's the yeah. connection there like is it something in the embedding space or like what like what is it yeah i think that this is an active area of research so the same author of uh this write-up that we're basing this discussion on also wrote um another article about the emergent capabilities of these large language models. And this is exactly what you're getting at, right? Is that it doesn't, there's something about its success in this task, which doesn't directly correlate with its two inputs, which is that it was trained on code and it was trained on natural language. The combination of these two is a sort of emergent capability. One very layman's high-level explanation that I've heard is that, again, if you look at code, there's maybe two types of code. Uh, There's imperative code and there's object-oriented code. And if you look at imperative code, it's it's a way of reasoning by chaining together some inputs and outputs. Yeah, yeah. And so the language model, by looking at 
imperative code would be able to gain those capabilities. Again, hand waving here. And then the other uh, aspect of code is uh, object orientation, which is another dominant paradigm, which could basically be thought of as training the model how to componentize or break down a problem into separation of concerns. And so those two things very, very hand wavily allow this model then to generalize that. That's yeah, that is weird because then it's it's hard to imagine a high dimensional space, but I guess something in the embedding I, I guess you could kind of hand wave to say if you could do that equation on language. What is it? Man plus Man minus king, king. king minus yeah, man king plus minus. queen uh, plus woman, woman is equal to queen. queen. Yeah. yeah, if you could do something like that, you could reasonably say that you could generalize something about code that generalizes to other things. Maybe for me, it's a little bit of of a stretch, but maybe because like I can't really picture in my mind how the embedding space works. It's it's a little bit magical even to me right now. Yeah, and and it's not just the embeddings. The embeddings are the earliest layer of these models. Uh, Once you go into the deeper and deeper layers, they are now basically the interactions between all the different inputs that are happening in a variety of different ways. And so it's very, very hard to reason about. So each each one of the layers is, I guess these things are transformers. And so they're in the first layer, they're paying attention to different aspects of the embedding space and then throwing that up as an abstraction for the next layer and so on and so forth until you aggregate to something that's a little bit more high level. I guess in that sense, uh, I I can kind of believe it if you draw the analogy to uh, convolution neural networks. I mean, like that is kind of a strange analogy because I don't know that a lot of people have an intuition on that either. But uh, I've seen visualizations of what each layer in a convolution a convolutional neural network is doing and all the lower layers are effectively being uh, turned on when they see very primitive types of visual stimuli. So like there will be neurons that only detect vertical lines and there's other ones that only detect like angles that face yeah. southwest or something like that and then so if you have multiple layers on top of that then they can aggregate them to like say there these neurons only are activated by vertical looking rectangles right they'll combine these lower things and then you have further layers that um look for a series of rectangles that are standing upright and then so those are good detectors for like if you're looking at books and so on yeah. and so forth. And so you just keep aggregating these uh, detections until you're further on. And so I guess I could conceivably see transformers doing the same thing when they are doing selective attention on the different inputs. And especially when you stack them uh, really tall and really high. Yeah, exactly. So they're learning some abstract things. Uh, apparently, when they see code, they're learning the nature of code. And uh, that was a, another big step change was that rather than simply continuing on uh, 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 extending some piece of text, now they're able to reason. And with that also, uh, they were trained. So GPT, the second iteration of GPT was trained on human instructions. So rather than simply extending what you, uh, you gave it as an input, it would interpret its input as a type of instruction and then try to give an output. So that's another uh, capability that was unlocked. And that that came out not that long ago. That came Wait, out... Wait, what's an example of what you just described? Let's say that you wanted the uh, GPT to write me uh, some ad copy for the, a PlayStation 5, mm-hmm. right? So previously, on the initial version of GPT-3, you could not ask it to do that. You couldn't just give that instruction as an input to gpt3 what it Mm -hmm. might do if you gave it the text write me an ad copy about playstation 5 it would just try to treat that uh, and just run with it and extend it so it would say you would say write me a copy about uh, playstation 5 it would say and then write me a ad copy about xbox 360 
and then send an email and fetch me coffee because that is maybe what a boss would tell a worker, right? Right, right. It would just right. be auto-complete of that. Right, because it could have taken it in a direction where it thinks that you're just giving it a list of instructions and then it'll just auto-complete more instructions because it that's what it thinks it, you're trying to do. Basically, yes. it's the equivalent of a cat looking at your finger rather than what you're pointing to, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and yep. now in this instance, because like we finally got it to look at what we're pointing to and so that's what you're getting at right yeah exactly so so the the initial version of gpt3 you couldn't tell it to do anything you would have to like give it some starting thing and then just hope that it'll continue along the direction that you you want uh the second uh instruction tuned code tuned version of gpt3 actually like you said understood the intent of what you gave it and then gave the appropriate output. So it would actually know, write some ad copy for PlayStation 5. Do you know how they do, did the instruction tuning at all? My understanding is that they collected a bunch of human-written instructions uh, as well as expected outputs and trained on that. Uh, they they fine-tuned on that. So, so there was a big data collection task. Oh, I see. That's weird. And then so I guess the autocomplete would understand that if people are saying these sort of things, they're pointing at stuff. So this yes. is basically you're teaching it to recognize pointing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically. So I guess it says, oh, this looks like an instruction. I should follow that instruction, not just pretend that I will, I'm giving more instructions in response to that. <laughs> uh, but like there are other types of like cognitive tasks well, anyways, yeah. because there's many different kinds of intelligences, like even in the animal world, like we don't recognize it as intelligence, but like if like some animals have hyper senses in either sight or hearing or some other like invisible spectrum to us. And so they had to have brains to process that information and they're intelligent at that. And so yeah. if you could feed uh, the type of text that represents like the input of other sensors, you could conceivably have it be really intelligent at that. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that's the surprising thing of what's going at because we originally trained these things to just auto generate language. But as it turns out, if you give it a specific language that requires a specific kind of reasoning, then it'll be able to generate uh reactions or or behavior that would re- would be required to generate that kind of text so like if you have code then in order to generate it you have to be able to reason about things right mm-hmm. if yep. you have instructions and you're able to generate like what comes out of those I- instructions then you need to be able to look at where it's pointing so that's the surprising thing here Yes, absolutely. That is absolutely the surprising thing. And uh, the interesting thing that comes out of that is that it this version of GPT-3 is also able to generalize to unseen tasks. So although they gave it some instructions as training data to fine tune on, it's not like it's only good at those kind of tasks. Now it just understood the general notion of what it means to follow an instruction. And now you can basically ask it to do almost anything. And so that Ooh. so that's interesting. Yeah, we're in trouble. Cuz you could <laughs> give you could give it like really good screenplays and say write this like give me like a a Hollywood hit or something like the the best rom-com there would ever be, right? And so you'll have yes. people that are bawling in the tears like like you'd be able to write screenplays or like you would like I don't know what's what's the what's the mental skill that you need to write really good screenplays empathy storytelling ability yeah yeah something and like so that. you might be able to generalize to storytelling ability even though you trained on screenplays you can generalize that to whatever that latent ability is yeah right right yeah uh i think that could be the case it seems like things you get much more than what you put in basically is the I don't know, upshot of, of GPT-3, it, it, it generally seems. Well, the, it's an aspect of learning because effectively learning is like you can generalize what your tasks are. And so it's like if you train people in one specific part of the industry, they come away with skills 
that would require them to be successful in that industry. And so, so it is here, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. And then finally, this, what we've discussed, just initial GPT-3 came out in, I think, 2020, 2019, something like this. Um, This uh, instruction-tuned GPT-3 was released to the public in late 2021, early 2022. And that's when I started sort of getting interested in playing around with this. And then finally, uh, chat GPT, which was what people are talking about recently in the last month or so, adds another layer, which is called uh, RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback. What that basically Uh, means is that they took this GPT, which can take instructions and do things, and they have basically added guardrails. The guardrails are learned from humans basically instructing GPT whether it did something improper or not. So in this case, they basically used RLHF uh, to limit the capabilities of GPT-3 such that it generates informative responses and doesn't make up things uh, as much as possible, as well as you know, generally teaching the model to be polite, uh, such that it doesn't give harmful responses or politically biased ones, or again, uh, making up things that it doesn't necessarily know about. All of those things are, you can think about them as putting safety features on what was already a very powerful model. And that's where I think that with those guardrails in place, they felt comfortable enough releasing it to the general public. So for reinforcement learning to kind of catch up on that, I thought it was something where it's self-training, where basically like it is generating its own data for, and then it gets feedback of whether something is right or wrong. Uh, that, is that what self, it is? Or? That's self-play, which is a strategy which AlphaGo and other reinforcement learning models used. Mm-hmm. But generally, reinforcement learning is getting feedback from the outcome uh, of some action and then oh, I see. feeding that back uh, right. to, so, to learn whether it's positive or negative. So then you can only train as fast as humans are able to give feedback, right? Yeah, actually, what they did was they trained another model, which is uh, a model that learned what humans like and don't like. And then they gave that model to GPT and had that thing train it. Oh, you would think that it would run out, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That I'm surprised that works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was surprised that it works either. And again, I don't know, that this is all a very high-level overview. Like, obviously, there, I'm sure there's tons of implementation details, which yeah. only OpenAI knows. Right. But uh, yeah, so just to sum up, like, that's the lineage of, of ChatGPT. I thought that this is interesting because uh, it's the same model. The whole time it's been the same model. Uh, a lot of time when people refer to uh, GPT-3, they refer to it as 175 billion, which refers to the number of parameters. That's how many numbers basically are in its brain. And um, But basically, it means that the shape of the model, all of its architecture, everything exactly the same. All that's been changing is the way that it's been trained. And by training it in a variety of different ways, you're we've been able to get these emergent capabilities that just over the past two years, uh, if you, if you compare chat GPT to its predecessor, the V one of GPT three, it's a night and day difference. Wow. That's, I mean, it's never been more true that the future is already here. You just don't know it yet. Um, with this. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, I'm the same here and I pay even less attention to this. I mean, for me, it's just cursory, uh, paying attention to this sort of thing, but I think I also did not recognize it for what it was until open AI was able to demonstrate it for us. And so I think this is going to change a lot of things, uh, for me personally, as well as society at large. So we're all in this dragnet together. Yeah, yeah, we're figuring out as we go along. And I think just to wrap up this this part, which is just what it is, and we'll we'll go into all of these implications, and there are a ton of them. But just to put a little bow on it, I think that 
the what I learned and what GPT three and Chat GPT really underscore is this what this AI research, researcher uh, Rich Sutton wrote in essay called The Bitter Lesson, which is basically that the biggest lesson in AI research has been that if you just take simple models and throw compute at them, and by analogy, by uh, throw data at them, for which you need more compute, that dominates any clever little optimizations that you can do as an AI researcher trying to encode human intuition into these models. And this is basically shown in GPT-3. GPT-3 is a stupid, dumb model. It's just a deep stack of transformers, uh, and it's just super huge and requires a lot of com computation to run. And all they've done over the past two years, all they've done is train it in the right way and give it the right type of data such that it can do more and more things to the point where now it's a significantly different set of capabilities than when it came out. I guess it's just so weird. I think it's just compute has become so fast that it's beyond our imagination and comprehension. I think most people do not have a good grasp and understanding of just how fast our computers are nowadays. Like it's extraordinary how fast they are. And so be, because it's beyond our simulation, like it's, it's hard to predict like when you do stupid things really fast at scale, what sort of things will come out of it. And that's effectively <laughs> what you have here. This thing does remind me of a, blog post that Dan Liu wrote, which I thought was pretty thought provoking. And in it, he went against Fred Brooks' common idea in writing about how there's this complexity in programming that you can't ever really get rid of, that there are no silver bullets to get rid of this thing. And one thing Dan pointed out was, well, I mean, faster hardware just makes everything easy. I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, and I guess that's true in some sense because, like, back then with limited compute, if you wanted to write a spell checker, you really had to do a lot to make a spell checker. But nowadays, because like storage is so vast and cheap and compute is so fast and cheap that you can just load the entire dictionary into memory and just run like a linear scan and it would be perfectly fine compared to mm -hmm. like what you might have to do is like you swap things in and out and organize the dictionary in a way that to enable lookups and so yeah. i think this paired with something that i heard in a talk about algebraic effects of all things uh, where somebody was talking the daniel Bewick? I, I'm pronouncing his name wrong, but he he noted that for software to operate at scale, it effectively means managing scarce resources, right? Because And then when you have to manage scarce resources, whether it's compute or disk or memory or whatever, that's where the complexity comes in. And so if you have abundant compute and abundant memory, like you don't have to put in any of the complexities because things just come up fast. You just throw things there and it's there. And I think in that sense, Dan Liu is definitely correct that one way to get rid of complexity is just to have infinite compute and infinite storage, which yeah. for some tasks nowadays we do have. And so I think we are always pushing computers and software beyond the bounds that they can easily do. And so I think that's where some of the complexity comes from. And so when it comes to GPT um, and this article about the bitter lesson for deep learning and, and machine learning, it's that if you take into account compute in the future and just do the dumb thing, yeah. and try to do the thing with lots of compute and lots of data, like that will be the thing that beat out any sort of like human heuristic that you try to do cleverly. And I think it's mm -hmm. the same principle at work that now you don't have to manage any of the complexities 
and just do the dumb thing and the computer will figure it out if you give it the right tools framework or building blocks to do so and because it scales beyond our imagination it'll build those things however inefficiently but it'll be able to do it i I, do you you get what i'm trying to say here right yeah totally totally i think that before transformers came out i was working in a research lab where there were a lot of linguists uh who were trying to get these uh yes uh, machine learning models like rnns and lstms and these types of other precursors to transformers to be better at reasoning and so the linguists were building these huge data sets and annotating them about these things called frames which were basically just ways of encoding what humans know about the relations between objects like a desk is a thing which other things can be sat upon right yeah it can be put right or like other these little capabilities that like we know as humans which uh i guess computers don't necessarily know yeah we would talk about them as like common sense like linguistics that manifests itself because like you live in the world and you have common sense yes exactly and in fact that was the term of art which is common sense uh this is common sense knowledge and they would annotate all of this data this isn't like some ancient research lab. This was like 20, 2017. And uh, they were collecting these data sets and then trying to feed them, use this as fine-tuning data to these machine learning models such that they would be able to understand things about the world. Turns out, I, I haven't actually asked ChatGPT this, but I think if you asked it, if I put a ball on a desk, will it stay put or will it fall through the desk? It will probably tell you it will stay put. I don't know. We can try it out. This can be an exercise for our viewers as well. But it basically, it the, the fact that GPT has seen tons of data has given it common sense without necessarily having linguists go around and annotate and teach it common sense. And so I think that's the same thing that we're both getting at, which is that you know we don't need to be cute about things. You can just throw data and compute at these models. And for the most part, it will learn all the things that you wish it knew. Yeah, so I tried it just now. And if you put a ball on the desk, will it stay put or will it fall off? It said, if you put a ball on the desk, it will stay put as long as the desk is not tilted or shaken. The ball will remain (laughs) stationary because the force of gravity acting on it is balanced by the normal force of the desk pushing against it. However, if you tilt the desk or shake it, the ball may roll or slide off the desk due to the unbalanced forces acting on it. Yes, it's like what goes way beyond like what it was asking for. <laughs> and so I, I guess that's the, the point that I think the one of the things that the bitter lesson, w- the article, which we'll link to in the show notes, is trying to say is that when we're working on these things, it's so tempting to try to enumerate common knowledge that humans have into the systems like i think i mentioned in previous episode before for computer vision researchers they try to select the features the the low level features that a computer vision system should uh, recognize and then be able to classify based on that but as it turns out you should just train the entire thing so that it selects its own features, right? Like that was all time wasted. And it's the same thing here. So I'm guessing the linguists in the lab are no longer employed. (laughs) Yeah, I actually haven't seen a few of them. So Uh, hopefully they've moved on uh, and redirected their efforts to where it is needed. But it seems certainly that their skills are not needed uh, to tell these types of models that desks are solid and whatnot it seems to have already learned all those things yeah and actually even more interesting is it because like it encodes that knowledge into its embedding space and like the weights of all the transformers uh i I think right yeah and so presumably you could get it to spit that back out in some form where we can understand it so maybe it would be able to recategorize linguistics in a way that that we would understand. Mm. Uh, do, do you do you get, I'm just trying to say like yeah. we 
have we trained it on a whole bunch of things and then it has that generalization or abstraction somewhere in that model, but it's not in a format that we can understand. So it would be interesting to have it generalize and write that abstraction out to us so that we, like if we were to learn Mm -hmm. linguistics from somebody that trained on all this data, like what would it spit out? Would it be the same classifications of like what the parts of speech are or would it come up with a completely different scheme than like say parts of speech, prepositions and stuff like that to understand the linguistics of a language that, that I think. Oh, I see. I see. Interesting. Yeah. That, that would be interesting because, well, I was going to say the encoding of its knowledge is simply you could ask it, right? Like at this point you can have a conversation with it. And it will serialize its knowledge. But you're right. right in that, like, if you ask it to tell you the rules of grammar or linguistics or something like that, it might spit back out the kind of human learned taxonomy of yeah, words yeah. and whatever. But you're I, saying I, I want you want it, to know what it's right. in its in its right, mind, right? And then have <laughs> generate a taxonomy for linguistics from that. And mm-hmm. so it may give us insights as to where we were right. And where we were wrong, maybe there's a, a better way to organize this so that so that we can actually predict things about languages and linguistics, um, right? Yes. Because like like yes. a, a a better a better representation can sometimes yield insights that you wouldn't have otherwise because you had a bad representation. So, so yeah, that, uh, right, and 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 maybe because it's been trained in this on such vast data and is fundamentally a different type of architecture than the human mind maybe it sees something perceives things in a different way than what we know right uh, right exactly yeah, that, yeah. that's what yeah. i was getting at yeah yeah no that's interesting uh, yeah and i think uh you know just to uh also to round it off i think uh like what is i've been thinking about what is a good way What's a good mental model to think about GPT and chat GPT and all of its mm-hmm. uh, uh, lineage? Because you're right that it is like interacting with a different species. It happens to speak the same language as us, yeah. but it does behave in a different way than, I don't know, what, what we do. It didn't it, learn it feels, about the world. Yeah, the it way. feels like an alien intelligence that happened to learn English. I and mean, it's really good <laughs> at it, but like, and for the most part, it'll fool you, but like the underlying mechanic is really alien. It, it just feels, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, it, it is kind of like we came into contact with aliens for the first time, but you know how in all those alien movies, the aliens are really weird and uh, don't understand anything about humans. And, right, yeah. You know, the the joke is like uh, the aliens come to Earth and they see people with dogs and they assume that the dogs are the leaders right, and the right. humans are their, you know, whatever, slaves. Right. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but nobody has made like an alien movie where like the alien majored in humans and yeah. they studied <laughs> this is their like uh dissertation where they have to uh, like do research and they've come down they're like oh we know all this stuff let's talk I'm really interested in this that sort of thing that that's kind of effectively where it is it's an alien kind of being that has alien intelligence that happens to know a lot about humans and speaks english so yeah exactly and so you're 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 fooled you can't tell because for the most part, it acts like how a human would, and then sometimes you, the 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 cracks start to show, and you're like, "Ah, this is like a kind of weird." Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. A human would not say this, right. but yeah. Uh, so that that's that's just an interesting meta thought that I've been having as I interact with GPT and people interacting with Chat GPT have to sort of learn the dance a little bit mm-hmm. of, of how to uh, interact with it, and uh, in fact, uh, there's. It's kind of a joke, but there are people now who have the job title as prompt engineers. Basically, these are people... (laughs) Which is the shortest career, apparently, in existence. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, we'll see how long-lived it is. But basically, the idea is these are people who have learned a good mental model of how to interact with these models. 
such that they're able to craft the prompts, which are these instructions, to elicit good responses from this. Mm -hmm. We'll see over time whether that type of specialized skill is needed, but uh, at least for now, some people are better at it than others. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so what, what's been a good mental model for a GPT besides like an alien intelligence? Are, are there others that you've been doing? For, for me, it's been like pretending like it's a intern that does things really fast, but you have to like double check his work, at least for the things that I've been asking it. But what are, what are some of the others? Yeah, I mean, I think an intern is a good way to think about it, at, at least in my own experience. Um, one thing that I found is that it's like a person or, or a being which doesn't know what you want at the end goal. It's kind of like this. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, as you become more senior, generally in your career, the idea is that somebody can just give you a high-level sketch. Hey, go do this thing. Mm -hmm. And then you go and do it. Fill out right. all the details yourself. You and fill the out all the details yeah. yourself. Yeah, exactly. And it's exactly like what you said. What I found when I get the best results from GPT or chat GPT is that I actually have to fill out all the steps myself. I have to mm -hmm. say, in order to do this task, you need to do this. And then based on the results of that, then you need to do this. And then you need to do this. But it's really good at doing all those things really quickly, much faster than I could. But yeah. it's not like I can just give it the end goal that I want. I actually need to uh, coach it through each thing one by one. And uh, by coaching it through each step, it is able to use the results of the intermediate step to then generate very quickly the next step, the next mm -hmm. uh, piece of the puzzle. But I think if I just jump to the end, it wouldn't actually be able to fill in the blanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, that's that been a good mental model for me too, because like when some of the things that I've been able to do with it is rubber duck with it for some design tasks or like if I'm trying to debug something um, that there oftentimes, it, I wouldn't say the things that it talks about is particularly insightful. Like it'll tell me a summary of what other people have been talking about and maybe it'll generate things that I hadn't thought of and Maybe I should try to tell it to remix stuff uh, that that it might be pretty good at, like remix mm -hmm. like this idea with that idea. But in general, like it's it um it's not insightful it is basically it. And so yeah, it, yeah. And so I I think the, another way that it, I liken it to is like on Star Trek when Jordy LaForge is like faced with whatever crisis that they just walked into that was completely avoidable. He's like, oh, you know build me like he'll just prompt the computer to say like, build me this simulation and then cross reference it with this other thing. Like he was the mm -hmm. one that had to say, build this particular thing, look in this direction, right? Do yeah. this thing and look, but it's able to like fill in the details of where to get the data, um, how to run the simulation and, and stuff like that. And then, but it's, it's up to Jordy to kind of tweak it, to, to figure that out. And so that's kind of what this feels like as well when I'm rubber ducking with it. Yeah. Yeah. I've had this problem where it basically mirrors what I have to say. Mm, so yeah, 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 yeah. I, it, I yeah. It's it, like having the worst improv partner. <laughs> because all they do, they yeah. never take the joke beyond, you know, the right, thing. They right, never advance yeah. the thing. They just right. throw it back at you with the right. same energy. Yeah. And sometimes, like, if you tell it that it's wrong, it readily agrees with you. And so <laughs> I've had to word things to say, like, to almost, like, word it where I'm taking the opposite position to say, I think it would be this, whereas I know that that's incorrect and I'm waiting for it to tell me that it's also incorrect. So I'm like, oh, okay. Like, like we're, we're kind of on the same wavelength here because like sometimes for things where I really don't know, like I don't know whether to trust what it's telling me or not. Yes. Yeah. I, I've been able to do some interesting experiments where I, I actually get it to do work for me. 
Uh, mm. uh, and have have you had success in like actually applying Chat GPT to your life? Uh, yeah. So I, so some of the s- best successes is when I have to do something on the command line in an ecosystem I'm unfamiliar with. So for example, like um, my my Kubernetes cluster, the no, yeah. ingress went down. And I was like, I don't know what happened here. And, or like the, uh, what is it? The um, SSL certificates for Let's Encrypt, like it wasn't regenerating correctly. And so instead of like going through all the documentation online for whatever, like uh, I only ever do this like once a year or something like that. I I don't remember, right? And so it was much easier to ask chat GPT, like, okay, this happened, like what? how do I fix this? And it'll suggest like things. And so oftentimes like the things that it suggests are pretty on point, especially if there's a lot of documentation on it and maybe like people have written blog posts on it. I'm like, Oh, okay. I didn't Mm -hmm. know this. And in addition, it'll suggest solutions such as this command for this command line program. Like you can do it this way. I was like, Oh, okay. I didn't know that. That, (laughs) That's, that's really nice. Uh, But you do have to kind of prod it and poke it to, to kind of get you something, but like just kind of a Socratic method for like solving this problem for Mm -hmm. that particular instance. Like it turned out that it was actually something else, but I feel like if my problem was kind of um, run of the mill sort of thing, that totally would have solved my problem. Um, And so in there was another instance where I wanted to use uh, Haskell to run this particular program uh, by by this guy because I wanted to run it and play around with it. But turns out that it needed a specific version of Haskell, which was not available on any server, so I had to compile it. And so, like, <laughs> oh, okay. I, I'm not I'm not in the Haskell ecosystem, so I'm unfamiliar with its package manager and stuff like that. But like having ChatGPT tell me how to like what are the programs that like what is the equivalent of like MVM in Haskell? Like you could tell me it was GHC up, and then how do you install this version, a specific version of GHC? Like what if it's not available? Then you have to compile it, and then so. Um, mm-hmm. And then like, oh, do I, how do I compile from source? That was the part where like it, it took a little bit of prodding for me to figure out, like I had to go look at documentation there to figure out that G, GHC up also had a compile um, mm-hmm. method because like GHC suggests something else. But like to me, this was the most successful types of tasks that it was able to help me do. Um, yeah. Where it's been less helpful is uh, debugging Rust ownership problems, which I guess I'm a little. <laughs> oh, mis- maybe maybe that means it's a badly designed system. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah. I mean, uh, you mean because like my my code is badly designed because like uh, I'm running into ownership problems because that's oh what no the the Rust, Rust the Rust uh, ownership is just so hard that I uh, oh I see I see AI yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah I see I I thought maybe that there's just not enough data on it because like I mm. hear uh, like I see on Twitter that people are able to do code generation tasks for them yeah on Twitter but um it's been helpful in reading papers because I was able to just plug in pseudocode and say, write this in Rust and annotate each line. And I found that much easier to read than whatever like pseudocode that I pasted in. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But, but when it came to like debugging the ownership things, I think the solution, like it, it didn't seem like it would be able to look ahead. Like it would suggest a solution that would generate other problems. And when I say this is also a problem and then it would just do the other one, I'm like that, this is a problem that we had already. And so, uh-huh. right. And so I think um, in that sense, it's probably good for rubber ducking, but I haven't able to, been able to get it to just solve my problem in code. Um, I had to like sit back and think about like, what is this thing doing? I'm like, okay, I guess I can do it this other way. So Interesting. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, one of the improvements that is rumored for GPT-4 oh. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> is the 
Uh, well, there are a lot of a lot of wild Rivers. conjectures going around yeah. that it's going to have a trillion parameters and uh, it's going to solve, you know, uh, cancer, war, cure cancer, cancer, yeah. cure <laughs> cancer. Yeah, but uh, uh, one of the more realistic predictions for GPT four is that it's going to have a larger context length. So mm-hmm. one of the things yeah. that could happen is that for some kind of problem like solving Rust ownership. Uh, maybe it has some general understanding of Rust uh, or, or just general idea of programming based on all the code it's seen. Yeah. But what it might need to do is to consult some reference about Rust ownership so that it can very quickly l- learn or brush up on like what exactly uh, it is and how it works and apply it in context to your problem. Yeah, so, so but you but could add to, that to the context. Right, but to be fair like it's able to do it but I I'm get I get the sense that the solutions it comes up with is something that exists in a documentation somewhere and it's mm. able to kind of slot it in a little bit. But yeah. like for the most part the solution that ended up being the thing was just that like I had to make a different approach so that the problem went away altogether. Well, you know what that reminds me of? There is this concept, which we'll link it in the show notes. It's called the XY problem. This is a problem that people have when they ask for help on mm-hmm. a, you know, a Stack yeah. Overflow or anywhere. Yeah. But yeah. The, the gist of it is that somebody's trying to do solve some problem Y, and they think that the thing that they have to do is do X to right. get to Y. Yeah, and yeah. so what they do is they go to the forum and they start asking, how do I, how do, how do, do I do X? X? Yeah. You know, it's like, how do I install Microsoft windows on a raspberry Pi or whatever? And yeah. if you start going down that line of thinking, then you're in for a terrible ride because maybe the reason why they want to run Microsoft windows on a raspberry Pi is they just want to, I don't know, stream movies to their TV and they have a raspberry yeah. Pi or whatever. Right. right? And they, right. they don't know about any other, operating system other than microsoft mm-hmm. windows you're and looking so, under the light because you're looking for your keys under the light because or under the street lamp because that's where the light is yeah exactly yeah. right and so i do think that the problem with uh, using chat gpt in its current form is that it will never ask you hey what the hell are you doing are you yeah, trying, are you to, trying do to do Right, <laughs> right. If you ask it, how do you start installing Microsoft Windows on Raspberry Pi? It'll keep going along with that, and like maybe it'll insist that it's not possible, but maybe it'll start to give some other weird suggestions about how you could do it in some other convoluted way. And ma- again, maybe with this Rust ownership issue or whatever, like part of the problem could be that you don't know enough about Rust ownership. Yeah. You're right. just asking how to do something, right? But mm-hmm. like it doesn't, it's not a master either. So it just tr- keeps trying to help you along this rabbit hole, rather mm-hmm. than just asking you, "What are you trying to do?" Like maybe I can help you some other way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think that's definitely it. And so that's what I mean by insightful, right? Because it would be yeah. great if I pasted it in the code and saying, "I'm getting this error," or like this, like what do I do about this? And it would tell me, "Oh, okay. Like typically, you just wouldn't do this. Mm-hmm. You would just take this other approach." So. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, that's interesting. So I think we we're getting to this uh, second part of our show, which is what what does it let us do that's new, right? And clearly, mm-hmm. we're we're sharing our experiences about trying to make it do new things. Uh, you're using it for debugging, programming, and rubber ducking. Uh, what else do you think is exciting or or interesting like beyond just us and our own uh, little worlds like if we expand it to just overall now that everybody has access to this like what use cases are you excited about well i mean i guess i can start with just things that i've seen on twitter i mean there's things like email triage i guess that's free yeah advertising for them so people want to write emails they want to write thank you notes so i typically like kind of the grunt work sort of stuff that it shows that you care but like the i guess it shows that you care because you took the time but like now that 
it doesn't take you any time. You can still show that you're care before the rest of the world <laughs> catch up, catches up, yes. right? So, yeah. so there's stuff like that, definitely. But I, I guess, like, I, I guess at the moment and in the near future, what I can see is it helps the creative creative types of jobs so say like screenplays or writing novels it's not that it would be able to write it for you but that it would be a partner like some form of like human ai synthesis or i guess you can just think of it as your iron man and you have your own jarvis now to like Mm. bounce things off of and so it's not just rubber ducking for engineers but like rubber ducking for writers novelists like something someone to bounce things off of because like oftentimes like you can't do that with people that aren't really familiar with your particular problem domain and your family definitely is not going to be able to help but just having somebody to like intelligent enough to to kind of bounce things off of i I think that'll help creative the creatives a lot better um Hmm even in marketing like copywriting tweeting i think yeah i think if people are going to be in for a bad time if you, they think that it can do all of that for you it definitely cannot i mean like i think for the tech Daily podcast like one of the things that shri and i talk about is like how do we get the word out how do we get people to like listen to our podcast because we know we're we're doing something interesting here and so we ha- tried to have it write tweets about our podcast based on the transcript and the things that it came up with it was completely milk toast and so that's not yes. really going to work there but i think if you use it as as a helper like we used it to summarize things so that we can like oh i remember we said something interesting here but then like we would try to write it ourselves um to help zero in on that um then that has been pretty good i think so Mm -hmm. so i think um those type of creative writing tasks that pervades knowledge work i think everybody will have their own jarvis to kind of spitball ideas with I, i think that's one of the bigger changes and so you can conceive this across i guess screenwriting marketing i don't know what else do people write novels um maybe even yeah. documentation <laughs> i don't know would yeah. documentation get better um, <laughs> or uh i i tried to make it write um a, a engineering design doc for work it, oh, did, it okay. failed it was horrible it was oh, okay it, it, like i couldn't submit that <laughs> but, uh, um also speaking of our attempts of getting the word out through chat gpt you can help us get the word (laughs) out exactly so uh please subscribe like our videos and uh, share it with anybody who you think would be interested in the future of technology on twitter facebook or otherwise so until chat gpt can do that work for us we have to rely on you our listeners (laughs) to help help us out with that um, and so I, I guess like that, that's what I thought of off the top of my head. And um, uh, over the weekend, I did show somebody who's completely outside of tech. He was in hospi- hospitality, like chat GPT. And mm-hmm. I think he understood it immediately when he was like, oh, okay, I can ask it like, what is the best hotel in Vegas? And then I was like, oh, can I ask it to write a performance review for me i'm like yeah just ask it and it was able to generate one wow. as a template and he's like oh this is really me i mean like i don't know it's probably like a generic one but you can definitely right. like rewrite it um yeah people have talked about essay writing for college students being dead and stuff but like uh, i've yeah. seen yeah. a counterpoint where um somebody said well actually another way to do it essay writing now is that you have to write the essay and you can ask chat GPT. You can only ask chat GPT for information. Um, but it's up to you to verify whether what it's telling you is true or not. Mm, I see. And so it, it kind of boils it down to that critical thinking part. So it's just kind of yeah. like math is not doing arithmetic the same thing here like writing is not putting words together it's it's doing that thinking part and so maybe that's a good thing 
Yeah, I could definitely see also the argument that the writing is not the interesting part about writing. It's actually laying out an argument. It's the thinking part, right? Like laying out the sequence of of arguments. And so one of the nice things about chat GPT is that it goes along with whatever you say for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so one way of writing an essay is you, you ask chat GPT, make this argument for me. And if it makes the argument in a satisfactory way, then you extend it and you lay out the next thing, or you correct it and you say, no, that's not quite right. And then, and then instead of submitting an essay, imagine you submit a transcript of that conversation and how you interact with this agent shows your underlying mental model of the topic. Yeah, and yeah. that is what's graded. Where where you would accept the things that you're telling you? Like, did you swallow its bullshit, or did you call it out on call it out on, on its bullshit? Right. So yeah. Or 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 if it if it was satisfactory, then were you sufficiently knowledgeable about the topic that you were able to advance the argument rather than simply letting it lay flat and just accept whatever it had to say? Are these what oral dissertations are? I mean, I've never. Yeah. Did one. <laughs> I've had a PhD, but maybe is that what it's like? I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know. I can't imagine. I, I mean, I've never been in there, but it does sound like a, a, the old way of learning back when you had, I guess that this goes back to the Socratic method, right? Like you just had you and your teacher and there were no books. There's nothing, right? You just have a dialogue with somebody who, who knows. You know, could you use this for interviews? Hmm, how so? Oh, I mean, it's the same comparison. Like, you interact with ChatGPT to design something, and then the the interview is how you interacted with the thing to mm-hmm. lay out how you're thinking about the problem rather than, right? I mean, I guess that's yeah, supposedly yeah. what those systems, systems engineering interviews are about. Like, so yeah. then you'd be able to evaluate people on how their mental model it was and whether they were ended up swallowing bullshit that chat gpt threw at them oh yeah let's scale yeah. it up by uh using hamsters to run the generators i don't know whatever <laughs> right. it is right <laughs> yeah i don't yeah i guess so it sounds like a good idea but then if i were in the position of a hiring manager i don't know if i would accept that as evidence it's it's always harder to be on the side of potentially hiring a what do they call it like an architecture astronaut who doesn't know Mm. anything but seems to know a lot of concepts well i mean it's it's one part of the interview so i mean yeah (laughs) yeah i I think it could be interesting i have saw i've seen people talk about just how education will have to change uh because of this I've seen a couple of different views of education. One is viewing this as an adversarial problem, right? Like a cat and mouse game where students Which have I don't GPT. think, yeah, I don't think they're going to win. <laughs> no, no, no. It's impossible. All cat and mouse games, uh, the mice always win, I guess. <laughs> right? like or, or, or it just or, keeps or, going, right? It just keeps yeah. going. Yeah. But I have seen some interesting thoughts on how you could use chat GPT as a personalized tutor. Uh, There is a concept in education called the bloom two Sigma uh, concept. It's just like a mastery. It's basically called mastery learning. It's the idea that rather than pacing learning according to some preset curriculum that everybody Uh. follows, yeah, you tailor it to each individual student, and you don't let them advance until they have completely mastered the building block. Because what happens is that as people go on and on in their education, uh, if they're missing uh, the core concepts, all the stuff uh, later yeah. on builds on top of that, and right. at some point, you're just so behind 
that you just give up. You're just like, well, I don't know how to do anything, right? And yeah, I think this happens yeah. a lot with like math. This, and things. Yeah, definitely math. Like that. That's one of the reasons why people think that they're not good at math. Yeah, I think like you have the same curriculum because it's a constraint of having one teacher because you can. You, it's hard to tailor individual to like. Uh, couple dozen people like two dozen yeah. people right right so if that's the case you know I, i'm sure i've mentioned this before but like in the book diamond age uh mm -hmm. by what's his face snow crash yeah. guy neil nielsen stevens. neil stevens yeah. yeah talks about uh the young ladies and chiridian which is basically a book that is a effectively like a personal tutor for kids and it adjusts to your age as you grow and so in the beginning it'll teach you letters and numbers later on it'll help, help you like teach you how to shoot guns or something i don't know but um <laughs> <laughs> or write essays but the, yeah. the point is that the way it was envisioned like the the point is that it's like a personal tutor tater, tailored to your learning curve and that's effectively what is now possible because even in that sci-fi book, the way that it was envisioned is that the characters in the book that grow up with you to teach you these concepts are, ha, are puppets that are moved with actors that follow a script and that's their gig. Like instead of Uber driving, you act <laughs> as these characters. Um, but now with, things like chat GPT, you may not need those things. And you, everybody has their own personal learning tutor, which yeah. I guess that can also mean that, I mean, you still have to solve for the social aspects of school, but then you could disassociate education from the place that you do it, mm -hmm. which I guess had always been the promise of remote learning, but for variety of reasons that hasn't quite happened yet. And I guess you could also have people that are in different, different um, specializations, I guess. Uh, when I was growing up, it was always that the older you are, the more that you knew, but it got to a point in college or like grad school that people, what people knew diverged and so you could be older and still not know a lot about what somebody younger that would know and so maybe this effect would happen younger and younger yeah so then people might specialize in something much younger and then so as a result yeah the, it, it might be possible there are kids that like don't read until later because they didn't find it necessary I mean, <laughs> I, I know somebody that didn't read until they were nine because they always just had an adult to read for them. And it wasn't until they were interested in the Civil War and had a book that nobody wanted to read to them. They're like, I guess I got to learn to read now. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So you're saying that this person would be enabled in not uh, reading through their use of chat GPT? Yeah, because like they wanted to focus on other aspects of their education, whether it's say, I don't know, dance or music theory or something else, right? Reading yeah. just didn't come along until later. Like you can replace that with any other subject, but like, right. yeah, may maybe that would happen. Yeah, I think that is, uh, that's fair. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, generally there is probably going to be a big change in how learning is delivered and also how people are evaluated because you can't no longer evaluate them purely on their output, which could be faked. Uh, so yeah, that, that's a big change. One interesting thing that I found going back to the fact that this GPT series of models is trained on code is that it's able to do complex reasoning, like we mentioned, mm -hmm. which is the purview currently of a lot of what we consider high-status, white-collar jobs. Mm, yeah, uh, these, yeah. these are, for example, all the listeners and, and ourselves do such a job, right? We work mm -hmm. in, in tech as programmers. Yeah. Uh, and I think lawyers, doctors, all the things that maybe depending on your uh, background, your parents 
encouraged you to go into <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> are, are jobs that basically are gatekeeping access to some reasoning about some domain. And that's a scarce resource, and therefore it was historically in high demand. Right. But now you have a model which is giving everybody a reasoning exoskeleton. Like even if the user mm. themselves is not necessarily that good at reasoning with their own mind, yeah. maybe with access to chat GPT, they'll be able to do all the things that they would normally come to you for. And so it's sort of eating the highest status jobs first. Yeah. Uh, is, is one interesting effect. Uh, which is good in that it's empowering, right? I think there are a lot of people who are not necessarily great at, I don't know, financial planning or these kinds right. of things. And so it is empowering that perhaps a version of ChatGPT or a similar type of system mm -hmm. would be able to help people reason through their finances and get them into a better state, help them avoid debt. <laughs> Right. Or whatever plan for their future in a way yeah. that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. Yeah. Actually, as an aside, it would be interesting because like, well, there's plenty of financial advice out there right now and people still don't follow them. And yeah. I think partially sometimes that could be because finance tends to be jargon, jargon laden. And so I remember reading why this woman wrote a book on personal finance and she said that well there's plenty of personal finance books out there already but there aren't people that would speak to people like me and so mm -hmm. you could conceivably have jet chat gpt generate financial personal financial advice in the style that would reach that particular audience that i think is really interesting right yeah. so so for people that I don't know, are football players, you know, they, it's commonly that they are bad at saving before, or like they would get grifted because people yeah. say there's this great financial like investment. You should put your money in there. And so there's plenty of football players that by the time they reach retirement, they don't really have a lot of money to their name, even though they made millions uh, through some like, you know, high point in their career. And yeah. so perhaps as part of the training, like the, you would be able to generate training seminars that would speak to them more readily. And because these things are multimodal, they don't have to generate just text. They could generate video. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And then also you can have the back and forth about like, right, oh, right. I don't understand that. Can you right. tell me a little more? Can you explain it? more to me about this? Right. Like, right. how does this make sense? Right. Mm -hmm. that that sort of thing and i i think that would be really valuable I, I think that that's an interesting take that i wasn't reminded of until you mentioned this yeah i i think that's that's a really empowering one i think it's good again maybe some uh financial planners or these type of people uh lose out on some business but for the most part i think that what's interesting is that there's a lot of latent demand for mm -hmm. a, a, this type of knowledge um yeah so it's not like the current people who are supplying the service are able or are giving business to these people who need it, all yeah. the people who need it anyway. Right. Right. There's just an entire class of people who have no access. So now it's solving that gap in the market rather than simply eating up market. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think one, an, another one that I was thinking about when it comes to like specific type of reasoning, like maybe design reasoning, like if it has understanding of human affordances matched up to the tasks, then it could conceivably design either physical objects or software that would be more amenable to people. But I was thinking more like physical things such as like interior mm. design or like um, urban spaces, because I think when you talk about like, high level reasoning gated services that people normally don't have access to i usually think of like design for mm -hmm. the poor right like a lot of times design t is high effort on the part of a human the the fact yeah. that a human has thought through 
a lot of the different edge cases so that this product or this space is easy to use or really nice to live in is because there's people that spent a lot of late nights thinking through it. And that Mm -hmm. sort of expertise has typically been expensive and gated. And so therefore, I think in areas where people are poor, I think there are some habits in which that kind of negates them. But I don't, I think even like the people that can't afford these things, they would still enjoy like nice spaces and like Mm -hmm. products that take into account their needs. And so hopefully like it'll actually be designed for everybody that's available for, for these sort of things. So I guess in all of these cases, like knowledge, knowledge workers have typically been less susceptible to automation. And I guess it's our turn. Um, as engineers, uh, I've often joked that it's our jobs to automate other people out of work. And I guess it's finally where we get the short end of the stick. And I don't know that we exactly know how to deal with it. I do hear on Twitter on and off where even programmers, they're like, I mean, given what we see is coming, am I like, are the skills that I built even worth it? You know, and so some of them try to reassure themselves that as GPT is right now, you won't, like, you'll still have a job. And I think that's true. Um, Whenever a new technology comes around, like, people aren't put out of work immediately. But Mm -hmm. I do think that there's going to be certain parts of it that are commoditized, especially people that went through these, like, programming boot camps and still haven't learned things beyond basic web programming, I I think they're probably going to have a hard time. And so yeah. in, uh, I guess the, the way that I think about it is that for any job to be done or any product um, and solution, there's a supply, of, there's a supply chain of things that need to happen in order to deliver that to a customer. And, along the supply chain might be the hard skills to actually produce that in one way or another. And maybe later on it's the distribution. And so if, and so some people are worried because they only concentrate on one part of that supply chain, because typically it's taken years and decades to shore up enough expertise uh, of those hard skills in that part of the supply chain, such as like programming or maybe illustration or, or something like that. Right. Or even mm-hmm. just writing. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, writing, whether it's a novel or um, copywriting or, or something like that. But, yeah. and so I think some people, they either love it or they are like, Oh, I trained so for so long. I've already put my chips in the pot and they forget that the chips that you put in the pot is no longer considered yours. And yeah. so I think that some people would say that even if there's automation, people will always have infinite needs. So there will always be another job for people to have. And the same people would often point to the music industry with the introduction of recordings as evidence that music survived. And I think that's true to a degree, but I think it's also true that there's definitely way fewer musicians than there used to be. Because mm-hmm. like when you didn't have recording, you would have to like go to an orchestra or like there would be street musicians, you know, like musicians wouldn't be like a, a winner take all sort of occupation, right? Because now... Yeah if you have recordings and like a cheap means of distribution, then you can have winner, winner take all dynamics for any particular marketplace. Um, and it becomes hit driven. So it has the potential to drive costs down and make music available for a lot of people. But that also means that there are much fewer people doing that thing. And that effect may come to dominate a lot of the white collar work that we were talking about getting replaced that typically have been gate kept with expertise such as engineering and doctors and stuff like that. And so maybe on one hand, everybody's standard of living rises because all these things are commoditized. But on the other hand, the people that aren't as good 
at these sort of jobs, the, the ones that your parents told you were stable jobs, like accounting and engineering and, and doctors, like that would all be driven down so that the people that are bad no longer can survive in that. And so there will be much fewer people doing it. And, mm -hmm. and then the amount of money that you could t make in those professions might be driven down as well. And so, so that's kind of mm -hmm. like what, what I see. And so I guess the solution is to move up the value chain so that you encompass a holistic solution for a customer rather than mm -hmm. just focus on the part that the AI can do a reasonably good job at now and in, in the near future. Um, and a caveat of that is that if there's nowhere to move up the value chain, except the very end where it's really boring, then you might want to get out. And so a case in point is like nowadays, like copying text from one piece of paper to another is pretty commoditized. Like we call them copying machines, but yeah. you still need a human in the loop to like move the paper, right? And it's a really boring task. And so you don't want to like move up the chain so that all you're doing is this really boring task that humans have to do. I see. Yeah. Um, right. And, and, and you're, and then like the automation does everything else. Like you still want to be somewhere where the, further up the value chain you are is still some amount of meaningful work. So I think like what another good case in point is Amazon warehouse workers like that mm -hmm. is sounds like a soul crushing job where there's a lot of automation um, and the humans are doing kind of the very last mile of it. Um, yeah, I see what you're saying. B basically yeah. there are is some distinction between the cases where the AI eats up some class of work, but then there's there's some other place for you to flee, which yeah. is maybe what we'd consider a leadership role or a creative role or yeah, yeah, yeah. So setting the direction or whatever. And then there's other cases where the AI eats up the work such that the gap that remains for you to flee is almost like you're being subjugated to the to the yeah, yeah. automation. Right, 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 right. Exactly. So if that's the case, then you just gotta get out altogether. Yeah. But uh yeah. if it's not, then there's still room to for, for people to go. But know that it may get more and more competitive for what used to be like like we, we hire like tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of engineers across the world and maybe that number is going to diminish. Yeah, I think this is a, a definitely going to be a debate that people are going to have. Uh, and I, have you ever watched The Office? The, the I have, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, one thing that I always thought was funny is if you look at the stuff that all those people do, there's like probably a dozen characters on that show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all of, the, all of the, almost all of their work it can be done now if you use like rippling or gusto or one of these <laughs> SAS tools, because like, who are, who do they have? They have like a bookkeeper. They mm -hmm. have like a HR person who files some paperwork for new hiring and firing. They have some, you know, they have the, all these different little roles. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a modern office, you wouldn't have a bank full of desks of people who are just shuffling papers around and, keeping the office running like the office management aspect of it you yeah. just delegate all of that stuff to to these automated software at least in the silicon valley wow yeah. that's strange does does the office seem antiquated when you watch it because like until you mentioned these things i never really thought of it as particularly antiquated no i mean i i didn't either like does uh, it feel like a period piece when you watch it <laughs> increasingly it does increasingly it does because i'm like why what do all these people why do you need all of these people to sell paper right like most of these people don't do anything or they I don't do anything about, directly yeah. related to the selling of paper well no i mean actually like jim Dwayne and um uh the guy that talks slowly with a mustache <laughs> Uh, I forget, and, and the, the yeah. one with the curly hair and glasses. I, I don't know. Anyways, they <laughs> sure, yeah. they all do sales. It's only the ones in the perimeter that are doing office works. Right, 
right, right. But, so, but maybe uh, now, maybe now with Jim and Dwight, you could have ChatGPT do sales. Oh, do sales. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because then who's then left? You only have be. Michael. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you only have Michael. Yes. Uh, anyway, that 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 was the, a little roundabout way of saying. I think there are certain there's a certain level of automation which we have just taken in stride, and, but mm-hmm. I think there's still some holdouts. And like you're saying, some of those holdouts are going to get eaten up by uh, AIs like ChatGPT, and then you have to figure out now where you're going to flee, and uh, if there's room for you to be a manager type like Michael who sets the direction of the branch or whatever or the company mm-hmm. that's great otherwise yeah you need to find a different type of word and that's a wrap for part one of our episode on chat gpt stay tuned next week for part two where we cover the consequences of chat gpt if it's going to be everywhere in our society join us as we talk about all this and more either on apple podcast or spotify and we'll see you next week bye-bye